everyone, and thank you so much for coming. My name's Rebecca Smith. I'm a lecturer in the English department. Um, we haven't got a stage tonight because the Nuffield's got another production on, and they've got to do this really fast turnaround, um, which also means that we have to finish rather promptly. So if you've got questions, we're now for questions, please speak up. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Claire Fuller here tonight. I hope you can all see us, actually, without the stage. If you can't, please do move your chairs now. Um, we are mic'd up, as you can tell, but um, please make sure you can see. Um, Claire is a novelist, short story writer and artist. Um, she's a relatively local person living at Winchester. Um, she studied sculpture at Winchester School of Art, specialising in wood and stone carving, which seems to me to be a very useful training for a novelist. She began writing fiction um, when she was about 40 um, and had worked already for many years in a marketing agency. And she has a master's in creative and critical writing from the University of Winchester, our friends up the road. Her first novel, Our Endless Numbers Days, was published in the UK by Fig Tree Penguin, um, also in Canada and by Tin House in the US, and has also sold in 15 other countries for translation. It won the very prestigious Desmond Elliott Prize for debut fiction and has been long-listed for the International Dublin Literary Award. It's also been nominated for the Edinburgh First Book Award in 2015 and was a finalist in the American Booksellers Association 2016 Best Indies Book Awards. Her second novel, Swimming Lessons, which Claire will be reading from tonight, has just been published in the UK um, and in the Commonwealth by Fig Tree Penguin and by House of Anansi in Canada and by Tin House in the US, as well, in, as well as in Poland, France, Germany and I'm sure many other countries yet to come. Claire's also a short story writer and her works have been published in many literary journals and won many prizes. Baker, Emily and Me won the 2014 BBC Opening Lines competition and A Quiet Tidy Man won the Royal Academy and Pin Drop Short Story Award. Most recently, you might have seen Claire on the TV um, when her appeal on Twitter for help in finding the birthday card that had been lost in the post, a card that she and her father had been exchanging for over 30 years, um, went viral. Um, the appeal has extra poignancy as secret and lost letters are central to the plot of swimming lessons, which Claire will be reading from tonight. So thank you very much, Claire. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I think Claire's going to start by reading a little bit. Yep. Is that okay? Yep, I'm going to yeah. read from the very beginning, um, just a couple of pages, and then probably something a little bit later on. Gil Coleman looked down from the first floor window of the bookshop and saw his dead wife standing on the pavement below. He had been, been amongst the shelves all afternoon, thumbing through the second-hand books from front to back pausing at folded-over corners or where the text had been underlined, flicking through the pages to persuade them to offer up what might be hiding between the leaves. The cup of tea that Viv had brought for him had cooled, forgotten on the window seat. At about three o'clock he had picked up Who Was Changed and Who Was Dead, a book he recognised and thought he might already own. It had fallen open and there, Tucked between the pages, he had been surprised to see a folded sheet of thin yellow paper with faint blue lines. Trembling, Gill had sat down beside the cup and turned the book sideways so he could open the note without removing it. One of his rules was that the things he found must never be taken out from their original location. He lifted both the book and the piece of paper up to the rain-streaked window. It was another letter handwritten in black ink, and when he squinted, he could read the date. 2nd of July, 1992, 2.17 p.m., and under that, his own name. The text below was smaller, and the writer had paid no attention to the lines provided, but allowed their words to slope downhill as if they had written them at speed. He patted the breast of his jacket, swapped the book to his other hand, and dipped into the inside pockets then tapped the sides of his trousers. No reading glasses. He moved the letter nearer and further away from his face to bring the writing into focus, 
and leaned closer to the window. The light was poor. The storm which had been forecast for Saturday had arrived a day early. When Gil had locked his car in the car park beside the Jurassic Crazy Golf playground, he saw that the wind had wrapped a plastic bag around one of the front claws of the Tyrannosaurus Rex, so that the creature appeared to be about to step over the wire fence on its way to do some shopping. And as Gil had walked along the promenade to the bookshop, the wind had gouged troughs in the grey sea and flung the top edges of the waves towards the land, so that now, standing amongst the old books, he could taste salt on his lips. A blast of rain rapped on the window, and that was when he turned to look out and down to the narrow street below. On the pavement opposite, a woman in an oversized greatcoat stood gazing along the road. Only the tips of her fingers showed from the ends of the sleeves, while the bottom hem came almost to her ankles. The coat was a dirty olive colour from the rain, the cast of the sea after a shower, and it occurred to Gil that his daughter Flora would know the colour's proper name. The woman pushed a strand of wet hair off her face with the back of her wrist and turned towards the bookshop. The gesture was so shockingly familiar that Gil stood up and was unaware of knocking over his cup of tea. The woman tilted her heart-shaped face to look up, as if she knew Gil was watching. And in that moment, he understood the woman was his wife, Older, but without doubt, he thought, her. The rain had flattened and darkened her hair, and the water dripped off her chin. But she stared at him in the same defiant way she had when he'd first met her. He would have known that expression, and that woman anywhere. Ingrid. Thank you. It is just such a beautiful and strange novel. Um, definitely the best book I've read this year, a book that I stayed up till 3 a.m. <laughs> reading, even though I was teaching at nine o'clock the next day. Um, and just in that opening there, we get so many wonderful, tiny, but hugely important details. Um, for instance, Flora, the daughter, who we um, hear will know what the colour is called, and so it sets her up as this person so interested in colours, and she's actually going to be a painter. Um, and, of course, the overcoat that he sees his lost wife in. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you went about creating the setting for the novel? Um, the setting is hugely important. There's this wonderful, um, dilapidated house called the Swimming Pavilion. Um, and the coastal setting is hugely important because, of course, um, for people who haven't read it yet, the um, Ingrid is going to disappear and we won't know if she's drowned or if she's run away. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, so it, it's set by the sea in um, Dorset, so in a real location that, that exists. And in fact, there's lots of, um, there's lot, the book is about lots of infidelity and there's quite a lot of sex in the book. And the um, village that I chose, and I wanted it to be a real village, is actually called Studland. And I thought, <laughs> I can't possibly call the village in the book Studland if there's okay. lots of infidelity yeah. and sex. So I changed the name to Spanish Green. Um, but it does exist. But I've if anybody knows that area, I have messed around with the um, roads and there's a pub there and I've changed the name and changed various things. Um, but I knew that I wanted to set the book beside the sea um, because my first book was set in a forest mostly and I do really like writing about... I like lots of nature description in the books I read and therefore the books I write. Um, and I knew I wanted to do the same with my second book, so I was thinking, I, you know, it would be great if it was set beside the sea because that's. I also do a lot of sea swimming, and that is the place that I swim. So um, there's also a town. The nearest town in the book is called Hadley, which in reality is Swanage. Um, and again, I changed the name because I messed around with the streets and the bookshop that Gil is standing in doesn't... There is a bookshop in Swanage, but it's not the actual... It's not the bookshop in the book. Um, and then it, there's also some sea stacks, um, which are kind of big columns of um, rock, 
where the land has been eroded and they're uh, kind of isolated in the sea and they, they come into the book. And then also there's a huge limestone boulder inland called the Agglestone and that's quite a strong mm -hmm. feature in the book. Um, and I just absolutely love that landscape. It's, it's, it's the place I go to from Winchester mm -hmm. if I want some kind of space. Mm -hmm. and, and you've got the sea and the beach, which is really sandy, and then the heathland. There's an inland pond, a, s a brine pond called Little Sea Pond. Um, and then all the kind of heathland behind it. Mm. It's it's a fabulous place. Maybe I shouldn't say quite so much about it because otherwise it'll I be know we'll all be going. Everyone, you'll all be yeah. going. <laughs> and how about the house itself? The house. Um, well, I because once I decided right, I wanted to be set by the sea, and I decided um, on Studland. Um, then I, because I knew it was going to be a real place. I mean, I don't always write books with necessarily a real place that exists. I didn't with our endless number of days, but. In this case, I did. So I started looking in Studland for a house that would be right mm. for this family. And I actually went on to right move, and I found a house, and I was going to pretend to, to mm. be a potential mm. purchaser and go and look around it. Um, but then I was walking around the village with my husband, and I found this other house, and I just thought, this is absolutely perfect. It's... Um, a converted tennis pavilion in mm. reality. And then when I went and looked it up when I got home, it turns out it's a National Trust house that you can go and stay oh. in. It's one of their cottages mm. that has been mm. donated to them, um, which is right opposite the pub. I did mess around mm. with that, so it's kind of nearer the mm. sea in the book. Um, but it's a, a wonderful place that I was able to actually go and stay in when I was writing the oh. book. Wow. Um, yeah. Just to kind of soak up mm. the atmosphere yeah. and, and yeah. the smells and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And swimming is hugely important in the book. Um, the heroine, um, if we should call her that, Ingrid mm. swims, and perhaps other heroine, Flora, um, her daughter loves swimming. Yeah. Um, how do you find that swimming and writing are connected for you? Um, not particularly, because swimming is a kind of release for me and writing isn't i find mm. writing really difficult oh. R i don't i find writing first drafts really difficult mm. i have to make myself do it i don't really mm. enjoy writing <laughs> what i enjoy is having written and having the first draft finished and then editing um, whereas swimming is is just kind of putting yourself in a completely mm. different element and forgetting everything so yeah. d I don't see them as related yeah. particularly, no. And y do you think about your plots when you're swimming or your characters? No, it's yeah. everything is just switched off. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> it's not at all. Yeah. I do a bit, you know, if mm. I'm walking around the sea yeah. or, or on the beach, but not particularly when I'm swimming. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you went about structuring the novel? It's very complex. And how you went about, writing First of all, writing it and then putting it together. Mm. Lots of the novel is told through letters, which span, and the novel itself spans quite a few decades. Yes. Yeah. The letters are all within a month or two of each other because they're Ingrid's letters that she writes to her husband, but she hides them in the books that he collects. She doesn't give them to him. Um, so interspersed with the letters, is Flora's story really and Flora is the daughter who's come back home because Gil has an accident when he's running after the woman that he thinks is his wife. Um, so the sequence is letter, Flora story, letter, Flora story. Um, and really it didn't start like that at all, it started with Gil. Um, and so I wrote, I'm not sure, 30,000 words from mm -hmm. Gil's point of view and he's quite a he's quite a difficult character. Um, I find him really intriguing. I like him, having written him. But I know that readers, you know, he doesn't treat Ingrid very well. He's a, he's a bit of a shit, really. Mm -hmm. And and after thirty thousand words, I thought I don't want to hear from you anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what I'd really like to know is what your wife thinks of you and what your daughter thinks of you, um, and see see you through those two different eyes. Mm -hmm. um, but because I knew by then that Ingrid had disappeared off a beach and nobody knows what's happened to her, I thought it was going to be quite hard to write mm. from her point of view. So that's when, when I started writing 
the letters, um, and she she hides them in his books. But she, because she's she's writing, the letters are about their history. So it's about when Ingrid and Gill first met, and right through their kind of courtship to when she decides to leave. So she's telling their history in the letters but she's also sometimes writing about what's happening in the moment that she's writing the letter. So Flora might interrupt her, Flora H10 might say, why are you writing that letter, mummy? Mm. So there are, in a way, three different mm. times that I had to kind of juggle. Um, and really, I kind of, I wrote it so that I could get just to the first draft, so I could mm. say that I finished that. And once, once I'd got there, it took about a year and a half, maybe, um, then I could play around with it and make sure that that sequence worked um, and also just check the timelines because it did become really complicated. Mm. And I had this big chart of how old everybody was at mm. different times and I thought I had got it. I thought, right, I've worked mm. it all out. Because you change one date and then everything is out. And actually if you realise that something is happened on a Sunday and this is in 1976 and the shop, they, she, went, mm. she goes to the shop and the shop is closed, mm. you think, oh, you've got to change everything. Mm. Um, so it became really complicated. So I had this big chart um, and actually when it finally it went, after, after done kind of editing mm. with my agent, and with my editor, and then they went to the copy mm. editor. The copy editor looked at my chart and looked at the book and said, no, it doesn't, oh it no. doesn't <laughs> line up, it doesn't oh line dear. up. Yeah. Oh, and so we had to kind of, I can't remember what we did in the end, but we changed a date on a letter and kind of fudged it a little bit. Yeah. I can't remember exactly how, but it was kind of... I didn't notice, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is no. very complex and a really impressive juggling act to sort of pull all those threads together. I, I wondered if you wrote it chronologically or if you sort of saw the story chronologically. I did write it yeah. chronologically, yes. Well, you know, yeah. Flora's bits and, and every other letter, mm. yes. Mm. Um, and then when I was working with my editor at Penguin, she wanted a particular point where um, she thought it would be good if Ingrid says, right, no more letters. Mm -hmm. There is no point in writing this. It's not helping mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. It's not changing anything. Um, so she wanted me to insert a new letter. But of course, in order to do that, because of my sequencing, then mm -hmm. I had to rework all the floor bits. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah. Yeah. It's I'm not sure. It's I'd hard work. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard work, and I yeah. didn't plan it like that. Perhaps if I had sat down and mm. thought about it, I might have made life simpler for myself. Mm. But it's just how mm. it works out. I don't yeah. plan, so mm. things just happen. Yeah. One of the other really delightful things is the way that you use other books within it. And the novel is so much about books and about reading. And Ingrid is hiding these letters in books that belong to her, her husband, who um, is a writer of sorts. Yeah. <laughs> and um, also um, they met when he was a lecturer, a very lecturous lecturer. <laughs> and... Um, <coughs> But he believes very strongly um, that the book belongs to the reader, and the thing that's and although he collects books, he doesn't collect them because they're first editions or they're signed. He collects them for the marginalia and the things that people have left behind in them. Mm. Um, and your book, it seems like just a sort of wonderful letter to readers as well. Yeah, yeah. I, d I do really agree with Gill's sentiment there that once the author. Once the book is published and the book is out there being read by people, then whatever the reader interprets is, is just as valid as the whatever I intended. Um, I think, you know, books become different things in the heads of readers. If I asked two different readers who had read swimming lessons to draw a picture of the swimming pavilion, mm. you can bet that they would be completely different dis despite the fact that they've both read the same book because we all bring our own experiences to what we read our own history, the other books we've read, what we think of that author, what we know in advance about that author and that book, um, all sorts of things come into play. And so a book in each reader's head is always different. And I don't think it's right to say, well, I have a definitive um, view on what I mean. I think, you know, I think it's great that it, there is different interpretation. 
And because Gil uh, lectures about this to his students and really believes it, I thought it would also be really interesting to try and write a book that really makes my readers do the same. So there is some ambiguity. There is some things, especially at the end of the book, that aren't that clear very deliberately to make the reader work and have their own opinion. Um, and that's been quite interesting when I've got mm. feedback from people and they often email me and say, oh, did you mean this? And, and I say, well, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I think some people mm. find a bit frustrating. They do want mm. answers, but I, I often I refuse mm. to give them. And perhaps that's, uh, 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 early on in the book, there's this excruciating, sort of hilarious, embarrassing, terrible scene of um, some of Gil's students having a tutorial. Um, and he gets very cross with them for not, um, not giving him th their yeah, interpretation yeah. Of, of a particular passage. Yeah. Um, it was quite interesting yeah. speaking to you earlier yeah. and, and how you, as a, as a creative writing lecturer, mm how you found that really awkward. Yeah. <laughs> I liked the fact that you did. Yeah, I think also I had, um, we don't teach through tutorials quite yeah. so much now, or if mm. we do, they're one-to-one. -one. Um, but it did take me back to my own, you know, back <laughs> in the 80s, <laughs> yes. um, when you were sitting in the person's office and um, back in the days when the whole of the history department was male and I didn't even notice until after I'd left. Um, <laughs> things like that. Um, things have changed quite yes. a bit. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, you trained as an artist, first of all. Do you think that affects your writing and look your way of working? Um, lots of people ask me that, and I find it really is quite difficult to answer because the only way I know of writing is the way that I write. So somebody who didn't train as an artist, I don't know if, they, if their thought process mm. is uh, different. Um, the, the things that I've noticed that are similar is that um, in the way that I write a first draft, I see it as kind of creating the piece of stone or the wood that I'm then going to carve. And what I do enjoy is, you know, the carving of the words and, and making sure that every single word is the right word in the right place and that it all flows so that hopefully what I'm aiming for is that the reader can read it without even realising mm -hmm. that they're reading. You know, you kind of get into the flow of it. Mm. Um, the difference is that, you know, when you're carving, you can, you're given or you can get a lump of stone. You don't have to make the bloody lump of stone yeah. <laughs> at, at the same time as you do with a book. Mm. Um, and that's the bit, as I was saying, I don't really enjoy, you know, creating the, the first draft. What I really want is, it would be quite nice if somebody would just write the first draft for me and then, mm. I, can, then I can edit. Um, but I do, I think I also see when I write, I see the scene play out in front of me, you know, in my mind. And I, I mean, maybe all writers write, see that I'm not sure but you know I would understand even what might be behind the character in the room that she's in without it appearing on the page because I need to know their surroundings completely in a very visual mm. way um, and people do say they f feel immersed in the landscape and the place when they read my books so maybe that comes from that mm. I don't it's hard for mm. me to say Mm. Um, I read also that you like to use music when you're writing, which I think is quite unusual. I wonder if you could yeah. say a little bit more about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, when I, I don't know why, but when I started writing Our Endless Number Days, which was the first novel that I wrote and the first novel that was published, um, I... I, I put on some music and mm. I started writing to that and it's actually, I, I wrote that to um, a band or it's one man called Iron and Wine who's, um, one of his albums was called Our Endless Number Days so I actually stole yes. the, t the title of the album and it got to such a stage where I would put this, put this playlist on it was about 150 tracks and it would just get me immediately into the writing zone mm. So I would put it on and I would understand, right, this is writing time, then no more pro procrastination, mm. no more washing up mm. and hanging out mm. the washing. You've got to write now. Um, and it would also set the tone of the book 
it was very acoustic music and um, very beautiful melodic music, quite sad. Um, and because I because that seemed to work for the first book, I thought, well, I'll you know try and do the same for the second. And the playlist I created was um, from a musician called Towns Van Zant, who also appears in his music appears in the book. Gil owns um, some of his albums, and Flora puts it on. Um, and so I wrote to his, but I think I had a lot fewer tracks, maybe about 40. Mm. So the sequence was much mm. shorter. And I think it probably drove my family absolutely mm. mad having this music mm. on, on a loop mm. again and again. Um, but it did really help. And the third book I'm writing now, I'm r it's even more melancholic. I'm writing it to Leonard Cohen. Oh. Um, which is... What could be finer? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful music. Yeah. And, you know, even sadder now. Mm. But, you know, every time I put it on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, can we ask you to read the next bit? Yeah, please? of course. Thank you. Yeah. So although the letters are mostly from... Um, Ingrid to Gill, there is this one note and one longer letter that Gill writes to Ingrid, so I'm going to read that. Um, and he writes it to her very early on in their relationship um, and is rather presumptuous about it, um, about their, what might happen to them in their relationship. But uh, I thought I'd... It's not very long. Spanish Green, Dorset, June 1976. Ingrid, if I could, I would turn our love on its head. We would get the anger, the guilt, the blame, the disappointment, the irritation, the workaday, and the humdrum over and done with first. We would have everything to look forward to. At the bitter beginning, when I am old and many parts of me don't work like they used to, and other bits have fallen off, you will return. You, so much wiser, will make me wait a long time, years perhaps, or maybe even until I am dead. After that, you will leave. My friends will not be surprised. In public, I will be vitriolic. I will get drunk, vomit on the front of my suit, and fall over in the street. But in the privacy of my bed, I will let the tears fall down my moth-eaten face. But you too, Ingrid, will be old, your corn hair blanching to silver, the backs of your hands livered, your skin looser yet more beautiful. In the decade after you leave me, you will insist we switch off the bedroom light before we undress, and when, accidentally, you see me naked, you will sigh and wonder why you hadn't taken a younger man, one who still had flesh on his backside. A year after that, you will move out for a week to your sisters, telling tales of pissing in the nettles at the bottom of the garden. Too many books and toothpaste smeared around the end of the tap where I have sucked the water from it. You will complain that I drink too much and don't write enough. Your sister will agree about what a shit I am and that you deserve better. Neither of you will speak to me for months. Tell me, do you have a sister? Five years later, I will try and fail to mend the hole in the swimming pavilion's roof, and you will refuse to hold the ladder because you have better things to do. You will ask our neighbour's 34-year-old son to nail on a corrugated sheet, and as you hold tight to his ladder, you will look up with regret and thoughts of the different life you could have had in the city. In the evening, we will shout at each other, one of us will slam doors. In our middle years, we will travel together. I will take you to Emerald Lake in July and hire a boat so you can trail your hand in the water, stirring the blue mountains that pass beneath us. You will hum a tune about the lakes of Canada and I'll put down the oars so I can kiss you. We will hire bikes and cycle across the Golden Gate Bridge on a cloudy day and the next morning our faces will be pink with sunburn. We'll travel through Turkey by public transport standing on the buses and ducking like locals when the driver shouts, Police! In Sweden, we will slip duty-free gin into glasses of tonic that we've bought in a bar and discuss our children, all six of them. We will drive up to London for the launch. As we grow younger, I will write a successful novel and dedicate it to you. 
I will sit at my window typing, happy to see you stroll to the sea for an afternoon swim. When you return, we'll take armfuls of books out to the unmown lawn and lie on a blanket with them spread about us. We will read to each other and watch the gulls wheeling above. If we are shat upon, you will teach me to swear in Norwegian. Then one day I will borrow a more sensible car than the one I own now and arrive outside your room in London at five in the morning. I will toot the horn with excitement until you put your sleepy head out of the window above me and we will both laugh and I will be full of desire for you. We will pack my sensible car with your belongings, your grandmother's velvet chair, a box of diaries and suitcases of clothes that you won't need when you live beside the sea. After you come to live with me, we will go to the supermarket and I'll press you up against the black currant jam shelf in the preserves aisle and kiss you full on the mouth so that old ladies smile at us, remembering. You will beat me at Monopoly and I will lose my temper and hide the Mayfair card between the sofa cushions. We will take a picnic to the nudist beach and stay there until the sun goes down and when the sea is lit by the moon we will make love on the sand. The last time you come to my house, it will be stormy and the noise of the rain drumming on the tin roof will be so loud we will have to shout to make ourselves heard. There will be a power cut, like there often is here, and we will light candles and I will hold your face in my hands and kiss you again. And when I lead you to my bedroom, we will know that everything is as it should be and that we will always feel this way. Near the end, I will say that I want you to see my house beside the sea and the next day I will drive us down and both of us will know what will happen after we have had dinner. We will cook eggs and bacon and move around my kitchen as if we had been choreographed and we will eat at the table amongst the books. The day after that I will take you to lunch on Candover Street for hot salt beef and a warm beer. I will walk you home and we will kiss for the last time at your front door on the street where anyone can see, but neither of us will care. Your lips will taste of mustard and cloves. I will write you a letter, Gill. Both letters placed together in Prophecy, What Lies Ahead by Oswald J. Smith, 1943. Thank you. When you were writing the novel, which characters did you care most about? Oh. And subsequently. Yeah, yeah. I th kind of all of them, yeah. really. Yeah, th th I don't really have favourites. Uh, I think, like I was saying, people find Gil quite difficult and I've had lots of conversations with people to say, he's so awful, he's such a horrible man. But actually, um, I think other people and me kind of almost fall in love with him at the beginning and go through that process that Ingrid goes through. You know, she thinks he's wonderful and then she obviously learns an awful lot about him and changes her mind. Yeah, I like them all because I, I liked writing mm. them all, really. Yeah, yeah. no favourite. Yeah, I do think I would have fallen for a girl <laughs> <laughs> when I was Ingrid's age. Yes. Um, and things were so incredibly different then. Yeah. So you've written this novel that really um, spans huge changes in the yeah. way, um, at least in women's expectations of men, I yeah. hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> no, definitely. Yeah. Because it's it starts out, they meet in the 70s, and although there was all kind of women's liberation going on, and, you know, that was changing, it didn't happen it, it didn't affect all marriages all suddenly all at once you know especially people who lived in kind of fairly rural places you know my my parents they got divorced in 1977 but in no way was you know their uh, women's lib didn't reach us even in oxfordshire mm -hmm. really um <coughs> so it feels like you know when you uh, look at the news and what was happening in that decade, it feels like, you know, there was huge change for, for women, but I think it took a long time for that to filter down into most real lives. Yeah, and because Gil is a much older man as well, so his expectations are yeah. different again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah there's this um, very sad 
moment where Ingrid goes up to London and she's just had the baby, um, the first baby, and mm. she's got this great big silver cross pram that she has to sit in the guard's van with her pram and um, all the way. And um, when she gets there and she's felt she set out that she was going to be dressed fabulously yeah, yeah. Um, but she arrives in London and punk has happened just yes. in the few months while she's been away yes and she's in these flares yeah. and platform shoes and, and of course she feels yeah. terrible and yeah. sneered at yeah, yeah. 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 And she meets a girl who did she have a she has a piercing in her tongue I think yeah and she oh, girl sticks her tongue out at yeah. her and Ingrid realizes that actually they're the same age they're both 21 um, yeah, and here she is in her flares and with her with baby. Her baby. Mm. Yeah, struggling so mm. much. Clothes are really important in the book too, aren't they? They are. Yeah, yeah. I quite like writing about clothes. Mm. Clothes and food. I think yeah, that, yeah, quite a lot. Yeah, um, yeah, because there's a pink dress that a big sequin dress that Gil buys Ingrid almost because I think he feels guilty, um, and it's. He thinks it's some kind of compensation, and she never wears it until the moment that she, d the day she disappears. So that dress comes back a lot. Flora wears it, and in the end, Gil mm. actually wears it. Um, yeah, I love mm. all that stuff. Mm. Yeah. And there's this very important overcoat, and also after Flora has Ingrid has disappeared, um, and Flora, the younger daughter, comes back and finds them. Um, getting rid of her mother's clothes oh and yeah. is, of course is completely distraught and says you know but what will mummy wear when she gets back yes because you know, flora believes yeah. that she she will be coming back yeah, yeah and um buys some of her mother's clothes back from the second hand shop mm. yeah mm. yeah um one character we haven't not mentioned at all which seems very unfair is Nanette yes yeah the, the, the sort Flora's of overlooked sister. character yeah. yeah I guess she kind of is even in the book, in mm. a way, um, she yeah she's Flora's older sister, and when Ingrid disappears, she takes on this role of mother for Flora. I mean that's partly why she's called Nan, as in you know, kind of caring nanny. Um, she's also a midwife, so if she f she finds herself in this role, but and only kind of later in the book do you realise hopefully how much she resents it mm. um, and it kind of all comes tumbling mm. out that mm. she never wanted this role in fact and and yeah she's not going to do it anymore mm. Mm. Yeah. and also as especially earlier on in the book um, I can remember just thinking but how could anyone do that to their daughters um, you know how could this mother Ingrid just walk out on these girls but yeah. I, you know, there's a. Th I wanted I wanted people to think that, and also then to realise that Gill leaves them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but and yet, you know, we don't question that so mm. much. It's you know, how could a woman leave or kill herself or whatever's happened to her? Um, you know, it's she has made a decision, and yet we don't really question. Gil, there's a point which Flora says, why is to father so different? The meaning is so different than to mother, because it is. To father mm. is just to create a child, to mother is to look after one. Mm. And, you know, there is mm. that difference. Yeah, and some of the letters that Ingrid writes are saying, please come back mm. um, when he's disappeared. Mm. Yeah. Um, which parts did you find most difficult to write? Apart from the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the beginnings and the endings aren't, aren't that difficult mm. for me. I think it's keeping the pace up in the mm. middle uh, in a kind of structural way, making it, make, m trying to write it so that people want mm. to keep reading. Um, you know, trying to, not cliffhangers at the end of chapters, but something that makes people mm. go, I want to know what happens next. Mm. Um, yeah, it's that kind of saggy middle, I think, mm. is, is the hardest. Mm. Mm. You've also got quite a lot of um, very, very tense scenes with um, the sisters arguing um, and, of course, the relationship between Ingrid and Gil. Mm. Um, how did you go about writing all those arguments? Actually, I find it really difficult, mm. now you pointed that out, to write arguments because I don't argue. I don't argue mm. with anybody. Um, not even really with my children. They annoy me, mm. <laughs> but I don't really argue with them. Um, 
And in fact, there was what there was Tim and I, my husband and I were doing a while ago, we were doing some art projects, and I was looking back at them recently, and one of them was to write down an argument. And I, so I had to write down an argument between my two children. This mm. was when they were, oh, I can't remember, they were quite young, 10 and 13 or something. And even writing that, a real mm. life argument, trying to kind of listen to their argument, mm. I found really difficult. Um, and I think in my first draft with swimming lessons, the arguments were really quite bland. Mm. Like, oh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right then. Mm. <laughs> and people yeah. would cave in, um, you know, much mm. quicker than, than I wanted them mm. to. So I really had to work on those to kind mm. of build up the mm. tension. It was, it's quite difficult arguments. Yeah. There is this wonderful moment where Ingrid paints a line across the girl's wardrobe oh, yeah. and not just across the outside, but sort of through all the drawers um, so that they're left wearing clothes with white paint yeah. on as well to stop them arguing about it. But I think lots of writers, actually, I know I'm the same. I absolutely hate arguing. Oh, really? And I, I think maybe writers just put it all into their novels. Maybe, you know. <laughs> maybe I'll just keep it. quiet and I'll go and write a novel instead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Can I open it up to questions from everybody else? Any questions for Claire? You mentioned the, the contrast between to mother and to father, which is an interesting concept. I should, I should, I should uh, just think about that for a while. <laughs> um, did you have any sort of sense as how that worked with endless number of days? Because the, the mother father daughter relationship was really kernel to that. Mm. Oh, I think there's similar ground. It wasn't it wasn't deliberate, but yes, I think there is. You know that dysfunctional family and and how one child will kind of favour one parent, and one parent will favour a child, and the relationship between fathers and daughters and that, that comes into both books, um, and both daughters kind of idolise their fathers for a while, and then then the mask is kind of taken off. Um, so yeah, but it was not that it just happened. And I can't say that is even like my relationship with my father. Um, yeah, but I think, that, you know, dysfunctional families and that kind of relationship dynamic is always a really, well, it's just an endless mine of, of ideas for stories because we, well, most of us have families. Most of us don't get on with some of them or get on less or see them, see one person differently than how someone else sees them. And, um, you know, the two sisters, Nan and Flora, when they go back home, they really revert to type. You know, they're 20 22 and 27 or something like that. And when they go back home, it's as if they're 10 and 15 again. They're just kind of bickering. Um, um, maybe it's just because I enjoy writing that stuff. Um, well, actually, interestingly, there isn't really a family. It's about strangers meeting. But they do live in a house and kind of end up having this quasi kind of family. But then any relationship be kind of becomes that, doesn't it? Two people meet. This Often one is more dominant than the other. And you know, all books are about relationships. Yeah. Thank you. I, as a reader, I've definitely been changed by writing, and I've definitely been changed by some of your writing um, in a really interesting way. Do you think the process of writing has changed you? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's changed how I look at the world and I notice things more than I ever did. Um, the tiny things that people do, their mannerisms, mostly because I'm thinking, oh, that could go into a book. Mm. <laughs> uh, so be careful. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'm more observant than I used to be. And I remember, well, if I was observant before, what happens now is that I remember stuff more. Um, and um, I don't know if it's changed me. I was going to say, has it changed me creatively? I was wondering. But I was before I was writing, I was doing a lot of 
sculpting and a lot of drawing, which I do less now. So perhaps it's just this is my creative outlet now in a way. So maybe that, that hasn't changed. It's just what I produce has changed. Um, yeah, I think that's probably it. <laughs> and which books do you think have changed you? The books that I've that read. You've read. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh God, so many. I mean, what's great about being a writer now is that I regard reading as part mm. of my job, mm. which is, you know, mm. fabulous. Um, and I've read so many. I read a lot more than I mm. used to. I used to read a lot, but I read even more now. Um, one book that has changed change my writing anyway, and, and I use it kind of almost weekly, is that sometimes when I'm writing my first draft and I just think the stuff I'm putting down on the page is really cheesy and awful, and actually sometimes it's so bad that I have to write in little square brackets, this is shite, mm. <laughs> just in case. I get run over by mm. a bus and somebody mm. finds this first mm. draft and thinks that I could possibly mm. want it published mm. or something. Um, and that also that is a way of getting that little voice out of mm. my head that says, you can't write, what are you doing? If I actually let it write some words on the page, mm. then I can carry on. Mm. Um, or if, oh, so if I get to that stage where I'm writing stuff that I just, oh, it makes me cringe. Mm. I get out Richard Ford's book, Wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, but that's mostly because it's paperback and, and light and mm. transportable. His other book, Canada, would do the same. Um, and I just kind of dip into that wherever mm. and read a paragraph. And mm. it's almost like it kind of resets the tone mm. for me. And I go back to my mm. own work. And it's not like I write like Richard Ford, mm. um, but I feel like the writing somehow becomes clearer and mm. less cheesy. And um, so that's definitely, definitely mm. changed me. And then there are some books that I just would love, you know, I aspire to write like. Um, not, no, not always necessarily the style, but the whole story, the whole feel of it. So um, We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley mm. Jackson, which is actually the book that Gill um, gives his lesson on when he teaches creative writing. I don't know if you, have you read that? I've book? read lots of Shirley Jackson. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's just a wonderful book. It's kind of mm. odd, the... the, the Setup is mm. really odd. There's something creepy about it without it mm. being completely unrealistic. Mm. Oh, I think it's a wonderful book. Oh, and there's lots. So, S Commonwealth by mm. Anne Patchett mm. and Idaho by Emily Ruskovich, which is a really recent debut. Bo both of those, mm. I don't know if they've changed me, but I just think, oh, I'd love to write mm. like that. <laughs> it's always good to have something that you aspire mm. to, I think. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how do you go about writing um, in a sort of male perspective? Do you find a big difference in writing in a man's voice? I have to say, I, I haven't done that yet. Because, um, well, although, you d well, with swimming lessons, there's obviously Gil and there's this, letter, this one letter. But the rest of it is really, we're inside Flora's head. Um, and with our endless number of days, we were completely, it was the first person and we were always inside Peggy's head. Um, so I haven't, I can't say that I've actually done it, but uh, it wouldn't, it wouldn't worry me. It just hasn't, hasn't happened mm. yet with the books I've written. Um, it wouldn't worry me at all. I think, you know, if I have to uh, <coughs> write about a woman whose husband does lots of, bad things and she lives in this house by the sea. Well, I've completely invented her. I don't think it, it should be any different to if she were male. Um, you know, I could write about a female astronaut, if, but I've never been to space. But, I, you know, <coughs> people write sci-fi, but they haven't ever flown off on a... <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so I think, it, you know, if you can... Um, you should be able to imagine yourself into anybody in any place, really. Mm. What's, what becomes harder, I think, is the historical detail or the 
country detail, so not necessarily the gender of the person that you're writing, but if, if I wanted to write about somebody in Rwanda, I think it would be really hard to do that just from my imagination. Yeah. Are there things that you'd stay away from writing about? Um, I don't think so. I think that example, I, would, mm. I wouldn't necessarily stay away from it, but I would understand that it would take mm. so much more. Mm. You know, you'd always have, you know, if, if somebody was living in Rwanda mm. and that was what the whole book was about, you would have, I think you would have to go there and live there because mm. um, it's just so different. Um, I assume it's so mm. different. I haven't ever been. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, you uh, know, well, there's some genres that I'm not mm. particularly interested in writing mm. about because I don't really read them, but that's, you know, my, my choice mm. rather than mm. something I would avoid. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if there's something I don't like, uh, I wouldn't necessarily, I would try to edit it, first of all. And for me, editing is just going over and over and over something until it becomes less cheesy, hopefully. Or if that doesn't work, then I will, I, you know, cut whole chapters and whole things out. Um, but I have found that often the thing that one particular day I think it's absolutely awful and cringe, makes me cringe when I write it. If I leave it there, then the next day, it's not like I think it's better, but I think I can rework this, you know, I can change these words and make it better. Um, so I have found it's best not to, not to delete something immediately, that there is often something salvageable in, in whatever I write. Um, but I will, I'm ha happy to cut too. Yeah, but that's the bit that I enjoy, the editing, the tweaking each word, and that's the fun bit. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, yeah. Yeah, it had um, quite a few titles, working titles as I was going along. So because Ingrid um, writes at the top of her letters the, the date and the time that she writes them, for a long time it was called um, something like Wednesday afternoon, the 23rd of May, about 2.17 p.m. Mm. <laughs> and I really quite liked that, but everyone was saying, it's too long, and booksellers who I spoke to mm. were saying, we'll never be able to remember mm. that, or people won't, if they come in the shop, they won't remember mm. that. And then even when I kind of put it past my editor at Penguin, she was saying, we well, won't even fit that on the cover. Mm. <laughs> um, so that kind of went out the window quite early on. And then it was called Spanish Green for a long time, which is obviously the name of the village. Um, but also Flora uh, is a, is, has synesthesia, so she mixes up um, colours and smells. So Spanish Green seemed right for that mm. um, to me. But everyone else who was reading the book was saying, well, you know, what does, what does that mean apart from the name of the village? Um, so... We've got quite a long, uh, quite a far along on the publishing cycle without a title that we are all agreed on, because in a way, the editor has to be happy and the author mm. has to be happy. Um, and it was actually my foreign rights agent at my literary agency who came up with swimming lessons, and um, we all just said yes, mm. that seems right, mm. because there are no swimming lessons in the book, but you know. There's lots of swimming and people learn stuff, so it just mm. it seemed right. Yeah. Thank you. It's you just mentioned that Flora has synesthesia. Is that something you have yourself or is that something you have in your head? No, I, don't, I haven't got it. Um, I'm in a writing group. Um, s we meet every month and swap work between us. And um, one of, I submitted a chapter or so um, 
to my friends in this group, um, and one of them read it and said, do you realize that you've described this color as a smell? And I just thought, oh, that's really, I hadn't noticed I'd done mm. it, but I just thought it was really interesting, mm. and I would just develop that. And the fact that Flora's an artist, uh, mm. you know, I quite, uh, I like, enjoy doing that. Um, but she doesn't ever comment on it, because as far as I understand it, a lot of synesthetics, I can't even say. I don't know. Yeah. Um, don't always necessarily know that they have it because well, there's lots of different combinations, but also that's just how they see the world. So I don't know if you have it. Oh, you do? Oh, and so lucky is it, you. Is it colours or...? Okay. And especially, as I understand it, when, when you're young, because you, that is how you see the world, that you don't think that you're any different from anyone else. So it takes quite a while. Am I right? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Flora makes no comment on it. It's just for the reader mm. to discover that that's how she sees the world. And it is this beautiful recurring thing with the way Flora sees things and, um, and how she comments on smells and colours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was fun. Yeah. It was fun. Okay. I think we've got time for just one more question. <laughs> James, yeah. Um, it's often said that the second book is the hardest to write. And after it ends on the day, you were quite something in the end. Did you find that the swimming lesson was more difficult to write because you felt you'd been up to certain expectations? Well, really, very deliberately, not knowing what would happen with swimming lesson with our endless number days, I finished the first draft of swimming lessons before our endless no days number days was even published, because I thought that if if it was successful, um, I would think, uh, how am I going to do that again? Or or if it was if it just kind of disappeared, I would think, why would I bother doing that again? So I very deliberately finished the first draft. Um, obviously, went on another six months or so of editing. Um, but it was it was a different experience. I know what you mean. They talk about the difficult second album, don't they? The difficult second dif difficult second book. Um, I went down a lot more dead ends, which I had to kind of track back from and delete stuff, and then try a different avenue, um, which I hadn't with our endless number of days. I'd just kind of gone straight through. It was the goalpost, so it was the third one you did. <laughs> <laughs> No more difficult than the than the other two. I, the first draft is always difficult for me, um, but I have finished the first draft of the third one before Swimming Lessons was published. So, uh, yeah, I'm kind of uh, now I'm ahead of myself. I'm feeling yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's no you know has, I don't know that Penguin will buy it, so we'll have to see. I'm still editing it at the moment. Thank you. We, oh, I think it's me. Um, we have to stop now, um, but Claire will be very happy to sign books. And she also does this wonderful thing in line with the book of slipping in a piece of ephemera. Um, so not only can you have your book signed, but you can have a secret letter, stroke photo, stroke bookmark, yeah. stroke <laughs> slice of bacon. <laughs> <whatever>. <laughs> but thank you so much. That's oh, really thank wonderful. You. <laughs>